Yeah, very good. That was, very uh, that was my mic. Yeah, sounds good. Great. All right, I, let's say it's time. Um, so uh, welcome everyone to our uh, session here, Intrusion Analysis and Threat Hunting with Suricata and other open source tools. Uh, my name is Josh Stroshine, and along with me today is Jack Mott. What, uh, what we'll be doing today here is uh, we're going to tackle the session in kind of two parts. Um, I'm going to provide the beginning, a little bit of introduction, and be really slide-based. And then about halfway through, maybe a little shorter that, then Jack will take over and we'll provide some hands-on demonstration and some discussion around that. So we'll look at some PCAPs, look at some malicious traffic, and, and look at some of the other tools. So I'm really here to set the stage. Um, so uh, a little bit about me, uh, Director of Training and Outreach for OISF, the Open Information Security Foundation, the foundation that is um, that maintains the Suricata Project. Uh, you can see some contact information there on Twitter, uh, at Jay Stroche and the Suricata Project, Suricata underscore IDS. Also an email address, so if there's anything I can help with uh, before or after this session, please don't hesitate to, to send me an email. Um, outside of my work with OISF, I do a little bit of threat research with Bromium, which was recently acquired by HP, an author with Pluralsight, uh, part of the Air National Guard here in the United States, and then I teach at a university. Um, Jack, I don't know if you want to jump in and, and introduce yourself. Maybe that'd be easier. Otherwise, I'm yeah. just going to read the bullets on the slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all good. So um, that's me. That's a picture of my face. Uh, my name is Jack Mott. I'm a security research analyst with the uh, Emerging Threats team, uh, which was acquired by Proofpoint a number of years ago. Um, we primarily put out uh, network threat intelligence in the form of block lists, uh, IDS signatures, and uh, work really closely with the uh, Suricata development team to um, put out rule sets specifically made for Suricata. Um, in addition to that, I, I enjoy you know, looking into malicious documents, writing Clam AV signatures against um, that kind of stuff, exploits. And uh, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, my handle's there, and so is my email um, if there's any questions uh, post-presentation. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Okay, so um, we have some content available. Uh, I know this, this really isn't enough time here to get too interactive, but we did, we did want to still provide you with all the resources that we're going to be using for this demonstration. Um, you can follow that lengthy Google Drive link. I did shorten it with bit.ly, so bit.ly slash 31, lowercase f, uppercase i, lowercase s the number nine and lowercase x if you want to grab the materials. You'll find a couple of labs there just to give you, uh, a, a, you know, some more content to take away to work with the training VM that you're going to see here in just a little bit. There'll be this slide deck. There will be a VM, an OVA of our training VM. You'll see that hands-on with Jack. Um, and then his PCAP that he'll be going through the traffic, um, and he'll talk a little bit more about that. So uh, there's the bit.ly that you can go ahead and grab if you want to get access to this information. We'll, we'll probably leave this up for a, a few days post-session just to give everyone a chance to grab that material before we take it down. So to get started, uh, what is Suricata? I think uh, if, ever, if anyone knows Suricata, they typically know it as uh, an IDS IPS, so intrusion detection prevention system, something that is creating those alerts based off of network traffic. Um, what I'm hopefully here to do today in part is to help you understand that it can do quite a bit more, and then, and then Jack will show that off here in a little bit. Um, as I mentioned, OISF is the foundation, the 501c3 US-based nonprofit that really supports and, 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 and helps operate the Suricata project. Um, Suricata, the source is available on GitHub. It is open source under GPL v2. So you can, um, I guess, consider that licensing when you're looking at using the project. Uh, it's worked on and developed for many continents. It's a very open and active community. And so you'll see that the foundation helps support a variety of part-time, full-time employees, contractors, as well as community and community contributors. And in fact, we have our community brainstorming session coming up here in November in which the community gets together and really helps to draw the roadmap for what happens with the project, what features are created, what is a priority for the development team. Um, many different modes for a deployment. So as I mentioned, it can perform IDS mode where it's just creating alerts. It can be IPS mode where maybe you're actually having it drop some traffic. You can have a hybrid IDPS mode. There is a totally passive mode in which no alerts are generated, but it can still log protocol data. It can get file identification and information and um, even perform full packet capture. Uh, there's also a PCAP mode. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute and that you can just feed it PCAPs and it'll generate alerts and other protocol data based off of the traffic in that PCAP. So it doesn't even have to be listening to live traffic. Here is a rather busy slide. Um, 
Yes, I will get that URL from the bit.ly here once we break. I'll get that copied out of the slides and paste it in there. So just hang tight. Um, here's a rather busy slide that um, really highlights how the training VM has put together. So our training VM is based off of Selks, which, which is a Suricata Elk stack. That trailing S is for Sirius, which is a web-based um, rule manager. So if we start at the lower left, then we start with the engine itself being able to process your traffic, um, typically coming from a span or a tap. The engine then has its own inputs, typically the rules that you're feeding to it, whether those are coming from an external source or an internal source, maybe a custom rule source, or you have some custom rule development. Its outputs, uh, we can have full packet capture going to other services like Moloch, which is, um, I always describe it as, as Wireshark on top of Elastic. Um, it also has as its native output JSON, and that JSON then we can further massage with Logstash, we can submit directly to Elastic, and then we have other tools like Evebox or Kibana in order to visualize that data. Since that output is also in JSON format, there's command line tools such as JQ, which you can use to directly query that output file. So it really just depends on the scenario. So this is everything that you'll find inside of the training VM that you can download through that Google Drive link. Um, as I mentioned, just a, a talk a few minutes here about some of the other features and capabilities. Uh, it adopts many standards for both the configuration and the output. So YAML-based configurations and even sub-configurations or sub-YAMLs. And then that output in JSON being also both of these, well, particularly JSON being able to help with the integration of that output into other SIMs and, and analysis tools, as you saw, I think a pretty good example in that previous slide. There is some multi-threading, a possible hardware acceleration is available, uh, native IPv6 support. Um, auto protocol detection, you'll, you'll probably see a little bit more of that with Jack. Um, a good example of that is uh, looking for TLS traffic. Um, for example, in a rule, we don't have to, you don't have to define the port that you anticipate to see TLS traffic on. You can use a TLS keyword, and then the engine will detect whenever a TLS session is established, regardless of port, and provide you the information that you're looking for. So I think that's a really, really capable and awesome feature. Um, more advanced support for different protocols at different layers, HTTP, DNS, SMTP, TLS, uh, file extraction capabilities across a certain number of supported protocols. And all of this is, is well documented for the project at Read the Docs. Um, as I said, it can do file identification. So you can get information about files, such as um, the file itself, you know, the magic of the file and the, the hash. And then it can also perform file extraction on the wire. Um, some other features we could go on and on. Lewis scripting, IP reputation lists, GOIP lists, um, bypass uh, a lot of the newer code is being written in Rust for a more um, memory safe environment to, to help reduce the attack surface of the, the product itself, the, the, the engine itself. Um, JE3, JE3S, traffic ID, some SCADA protocols, and I said the list goes on and on. Um, not every Circuit instance has to be deployed into a production network. You can use it. I regularly use it, as I'm sure many do, for malware analysis. Here you can see um, Circata being integrated with Cuckoo, um, Vanilla Cuckoo 207. And part of the summary, after you've submitted something for analysis, if you have Suricata configured, you'll see that there's a box if any Suricata alerts were raised. And then under your network tab, you can explore those alerts. So those are just the raw alerts taken from Suricata post-processing, looking at the PCAP file. Uh, we actually did a, a webinar on this a few months ago in configuring Suricata to run with Cuckoo. So that's something you can go check out if you are interested in that. Um, of course, many popular sandboxes are going to use an IDS, for example, any run. Here's example output from any run on a Loki bot, which tends to make a lot of noise. Um, so you can just see how they've incorporated those alerts into the analysis and really how valuable this level of alerting on the network traffic can be when trying to just get an overall assessment of a potential threat. So um, I mentioned there are PCAP processing mode, and there are really a, a number of ways to process the PCAP. Uh, if you have a PCAP or a repository, a folder of PCAPs that you want to process, then Suricata can do that. Um, here you can see the command, primarily dash R, and then the path to the PCAP or the, the repository, the directory of the folder that contains all the PCAPs that you want to process. Um, 
what we cover in the video that I alluded to during that webinar just a few minutes ago is to run Suricata in socket mode. And then you can run Suricata in socket mode and then just submit the PCAPs to it through via socket. And this actually is quite a performance improvement because when you run Suricata in this offline mode, every time you tell it to process a PCAP or a directory of PCAPs, the engine has to start, it has to initialize, it has to process and load up all your rules. And when it's in socket mode, it's already done that. And then you're just feeding it PCAP and it's only processing the PCAP. So it can be quite a cost saving, especially if you're thinking about an environment like, like malware analysis, where you're submitting things to a sandbox. And every time an analysis complete, it has to load up that engine, you know, socket mode can help reduce some of that analysis time. So it's really, uh, you know, it's a good thing to consider multiple Suricata instances for malware analysis, for QA, for testing, um, for offline analysis, maybe you have an instance that you're just running, um, you know, big chunks of your traffic through to do some threat hunting instead of working with those production sensors. So there's a lot of flexibility and a lot of different deployment scenarios that you can consider. Um, here you can see just a, a brief example of the JSON output. Everything that the engine outputs by default goes into this JSON file. So it's not just the alert data, it's the protocol data, it's the metadata, it's information about the files, statistics about the engine, everything goes into that file. So it's there for you to query, to submit to you know, an elastic instance and then build visualizations off of that. Um, and it's really the place to start when learning exactly how much information the engine is, is outputting if you're not familiar with that. Uh, it does have the ability to do full packet capture, uh, FPC. It can write into one PCAP or one PCAP per thread. Uh, the value with full packet capture is that not only can you feed that full packet capture to other tools like Moloch, um, but it gives you then that ability to timeline, to look back in history over your traffic. It's going to help support when an incident occurs and you need to do some investigation because, uh, of course, the traffic is very temporal and once it's gone, it's gone. And if you have no record of that, then it really limits your ability to go back and see what happened, again, in, in a situation where maybe you're responding to an incident. Um, there's other capabilities such as community ID. Uh, it can oftentimes be desirable to correlate flow data between different monitoring tools. So a good example of this would be between Zeek or, or formerly known as Bro and Suricata. And so community ID can be enabled quite simply in Suricata's YAML. There's just a, essentially a Boolean value. You go from disabled to enabled. It's disabled by default. And then you, you pick a seed value that you have to synchronize amongst all of these uh, devices that are generating and, and that you want to correlate based off of this community ID. This ID then is added to the Eve output, so the Eve.json, and that's what allows you then to correlate data between, say, your Suricata sensor and your Zeek. So here's an example. Uh, this is just simply the YAML file. You can open up Suricata's primary configuration look for the community ID section here and go from false to true and then set that seed value. And you can see that in quite a bit of the, of the actual configuration file, there's, there's notes to help you understand what that setting entails and information about how to set it. Of course, there's also the documentation, which is another good resource and typically a little bit more verbose. Here is an example of a flow type you can see at the very bottom is the community ID value. So um, the different records are going to be your event types. I'm sorry, I think I said flow type, but your event type. Um, in this case, a flow, you see the event type above that was an alert. Also, there's a community ID there as well. Um, and this is more or less the basic structure that you have inside of that eve.json file. So um, let's talk a minute then about threat hunting. So that's a little bit about Suricata and all that it can do and how it can integrate with other open source tools. But what about using it as the foundation for the data that you generate to use your, your threat hunting process? So what is threat hunting? Thre threat hunting can be defined many ways. Um, a, 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 you know, a definition that we typically settle on in our trainings and workshops is a proactive process of looking for adversary or threat actors. Um, so, this is largely or can largely be an ad hoc activity. Um, we oftentimes have to go out of our way to look for the unknown, to try to discover new patterns of behavior that then we can identify or attribute to those, those threat actors, those malicious actors. It really takes a, a hybrid approach. We have to combine a lot of different 
security tools, data analysis, threat intelligence, and, and really at the heart of it then is the analyst itself, uh, the human being that's able to apply instinct and to, to really process that data. Um, ideally, this is something that happens within um, a security program and that there is someone who is given some time and some freedom to do some proactive ad hoc threat hunting. Um, it is a very iterative process. Uh, there is going to be scenarios and situations in which maybe the data isn't there, the patterns aren't there, the time to investigate isn't there. And so we come back and we're always looking at, you know, taking some piece of information, some little nugget of information and, and trying to build upon that. And if we reach a dead end, go back a few steps and maybe explore a different idea or a different path. Um, but it's, we continue and through this process of exploration, we continue to grow and mature this threat hunting program. Um, so why threat hunt? Well, uh, there's probably a number of reasons. I think some of the more compelling, if you look at some recent reports, for example, the SAN survey that was released a few years ago, um, is that the respondents to the survey are indicating that they had measurable improvements of their InfoSec programs when they were doing threat hunting. So, you know, that, that's, I think, a good thing, right? Our goal here with threat hunting program is ultimately to either make our environments more secure to identify where we potentially have these weaknesses and figure out ways to then move forward and, and better secure the environment, um, but then also to reduce what we would call dwell time, to be able to reduce the time that an intrusion occurs and we are able as an organization or as a security team to discover that. So we want to use threat hunting as a way to do both of those things, uh, to help improve the security posture of the organization and then to reduce the dwell time between intrusions and detection. Um, and of course, on the off chance, it may allow us to be superheroes on Twitter, although I, I think many of us were maybe a little concerned yesterday when Twitter wasn't responding or loading. I know I had a, a moment of panic when Twitter wasn't working. I thought maybe the whole internet had finally decided to shut down for a time. Um, so there, I've already defined dwell time a little bit. Um, some more data, uh, according to FireEye, global average in 2019 was 99 days. 99 days between an intrusion and when the organization was able to detect the intrusion had incurred. So we wanna reduce that and threat hunting can help with that process. Uh, here you can see uh, a graph another from another um, threat report study from a few years ago that uh, what it's essentially saying is that given enough time, an adversary can then fully compromise the environment that they're in. And so, of course, the, the shorter we allow them to dwell in the environment, ultimately the better we position will be to reduce the impact from that threat actor. So... Traditionally, a manual process, if you want to look back at some historical documents, uh, the cuckoo's egg by Cliff Stoll is a good example of um, beginning this, this iterative threat hunting process. Uh, it starts with a clue, and that clue can help then lead to a deeper investigation. Um, any number of different clues or pieces of evidence or pieces of data or ideas can be the, the instigator, the, the, the reason that we begin doing some threat hunting. Um, there are three more, maybe more common approaches. One is an IOC-based approach in which we're given some piece of information, maybe it's an IP, maybe it's a hash, maybe it's a domain, and we use that then to start exploring the environment, to start exploring that threat and see how much information we can gather. Um, perhaps it's anomaly-based. Uh, we see something that stands out or we see uh, you know abnormal port usage or we see uh, very large DNS queries or, or something that stands out that we start you know we recognize that anomaly and we start investigating further we could certainly be using historical data about threat actors and their TTPs or tactics techniques and procedures and taking our understanding of how adversaries operate, you know, think of MITRE ATT&CK, and use those TTPs then to go into our environment and say, okay, I want to look to see if I can find any evidence of these TTPs in this environment. And if so, let's investigate further and let's see how far we can go to either identify this as legitimate or normal or at least non-malicious, uh, all the way to maybe we have discovered something here that was previously undiscovered and we, we have an incident that we need or should be responding to. All right, Jack, I'm a little fast, but I think that was about a solid 20 minutes. Um, so I will stop my share. Um, I have, if you have any questions, uh, now is a great time to ask me. Otherwise, um, I'm going to get that link in the chat and, and turn it over to you, Jack.
Sorry, I'm on mute. Um, I just uh, shared my screen. Hopefully everyone can see this here. Yep, looks good. Awesome. So um, yeah, so this is the uh, Selks uh, virtual machine that is um, obtainable through that Google Drive link. Um, this is a really neat little uh, virtual machine just packed full of tools here. Um, you know, some of this, uh, there's some information here in like this info.html and readme.html, which will help uh, kind of just for the first run configure everything necessary. Um, but essentially we have just the tools that I like to use uh, in terms of network threat hunting, things like Suricata, Evebox, Moloch, um, things that Josh had mentioned. So um, for this portion, I wanted to um, kind of just start by walking through sort of a network investigation of some suspicious activity. Um, this is from Brad Duncan's website, uh, Malware Traffic Analysis. Um, Brad Duncan is a, a longtime member of the information security community. Um, his website, Malware Traffic Analysis, has been a staple for anyone looking for, you know, PCAPs, artifacts, malware. Um, so very thankful for Brad to, to provide this kind of stuff. And I think it, it is a perfect, um, you know, use case for, for this. Um, so in this case, we're starting with a malicious document. Um, this is a screenshot of what that looks like. Obviously, um, you know, very evil in the sense that we're being asked, asked to run macros, which is a very common technique uh, threat actors use when trying to deliver malware. Um, while we won't get into sort of what's happening under the hood of this document, in short, um, if you were to enable content, we would uh, have a VBS file dropped and from there our infection begins. And that's where we'll pick it up from a network perspective. Um, so with the PCAP that is also in the um, Google Drive uh, directory there, um, we can start. So within Selks, uh, under the exercises directory, um, we have several things here. Um, first of all, we have the PCAP we're gonna use for this walkthrough. And then we have a couple other important uh, files I wanna mention. So the first is the sigdev.rules. Um, this is just a uh, local rules file where we could implement any custom rules we wanted to try out. Um, there are a couple examples in there currently. Um, you just would have to uncomment them to have them run. And then the big one that we wanted to look at is the suri.sh script. Um, so this is a script that simply reads in PCAPs and does a few things. Uh, most importantly, it helps kind of configure the environment to uh, take a look at the contents of that PCAP through the different tools. So we're doing things like removing artifacts from previous runs, um, restarting services, and kind of just giving us a blank slate to look into with things like Moloch, uh, Logstash. Um, and then last but not least, we're running Suricata against uh, our YAML file here. And then we're just quickly printing out some of the alerts found in the eve.json file um, to the um, command line. Um, so that's useful, but then we can kind of pivot from there into our other tools on the uh, VM to get a closer look. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and call the suri.sh script against the uh, infection PCAP that we want to look into. To do that elevated. Um, and this does take a little bit to run um, just because, you know, all the processes it's kind of running on the back end, right? Uh, removing things, starting services, and then ultimately running the PCAP. Um, so, you know, right now this uh, VM has Suricata 6.0, uh, which is the latest release, um, I believe, that came out last week um, or two weeks ago. Uh, either way, very recently, um, another major uh, release from the OISF uh, Suricata development team, which is very cool. Uh, congrats. Um, you know, one of the cool things about having Suricata open sourced is, you know, the community um, really has a hand in how the development goes in terms of both the speed and the features. So with Suricata, we do see um, a lot of community involvement that gives us kind of the features we want and the features that people are going to use. And at the same time, it's released often um, and updated often in the form of like point releases, um, you know, just for stability and usage there. So um, that's a really nice benefit of, of being open sourced, um, specifically comparing it against something like Snort, which, you know, is owned by Cisco. And there's just a little bit more, um, I think, red tape in um, their releases there. Um, so again, here we are. We're still kind of running here. Um, Currently, we're ingesting uh, this PCAP into Moloch. And kind of while that's happening, um, we can take a look at this PCAP um, within Wireshark just to get a quick idea. Although everything seems a little bit 
frozen right now, so I must not have uh, sacrificed enough to the demo gods. Cool. So uh, while that's running, we'll pop this open within Wireshark. And kind of while this stuff's um, booting up a little bit, um, does anyone in chat have any questions or is there anything else we can specifically look into while we're going through this PCAP? Uh, yeah, Jack, there's, there was one question. Uh, to reduce the time to run straight as H, we could run it in socket mode. Uh, the script's not set up to do that, but yes, we could. Um, one thing to keep in mind with the VM is it is, a, it is an ELK stack, so uh, it does require quite a bit of resources. Typically, if you run into issues with it, just double check um, six gigs of memory or more, eight is, is pref the preferred minimum, but we've been okay with six gigs and uh, you know a couple of, of these CPU cores are, are ideal. So if you see issues or lag or you just start getting errors, like your elastic is dying, it's probably due to resource issues. Yeah, it's definitely a little bit, uh, a little bit burly, but we're limping along. So um, yeah, so this is just the default Wireshark layout. Um, you know, everyone kind of likes to change the way it looks, you know, um, whether you're doing hamburger style or kind of swapping around, but we can just do a couple of quick, um, you know, filters I like to use just to kind of drill into um, just really quick things that are easy to eyeball. So for example, I'm just filtering here by HTTP requests and already I'm kind of seeing some interesting things. Um, you know, again, uh, some things like a post, um, things that look like uh, computer usernames, um, some, you know, retrieval of uh, files, get requests like that. Um, so definitely, you know, some interesting bits off the get-go. Um, you know, scrolling around here, I'm seeing some uh, TLS traffic, um, you know, definitely something that we'll probably want to look into uh, once we see kind of what we're getting back from Suricata. So it looks like we are running Suricata now at this point. If I'm not mistaken, I thought the Suri.sh script was uh, utilizing socket mode. And if it's not, then there is uh, an option to, I think it's like commented out, like one line runs on socket mode and then the other um, just runs on uh, kind of the standard uh, ingest mode. Yeah, you may be right. I think this version is just, is just regular offline mode. So, but I, I do, think that there is a comment in there if you wanted to check that out, if anyone wants to check that out. Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely easily, uh, it's an easy script to kind of look, look into and just, uh, you know, take a look at what's happening there and modify it based on how you want to, whether it's, you know, implementing your own rules or uh, doing a couple other things there. Um, but again, yeah, just coming back to the PCAP, right? Um, you know, digging into SSL certs is something I like to do. Um, especially when it's on things like uh, non-standard ports. Um, again, we're seeing the source port is 447. So um, anytime I'm seeing SSL certs served on a, a non-standard kind of 443 uh, or 8443 type port, um, I'm definitely interested in what's happening there. Um, you know, looking into the subject here, uh, you know, I'm seeing example.com. Um, along with just some really generic sort of uh, subject information. Um, you know, these are the kinds of things that uh, would pique my interest big time, depending on kind of what I'm looking for, but from a hunting perspective, especially. Awesome, uh, so our script uh, did run here. We have a couple statistics here, but um, we did confirm, we read in the PCAP file, both packets and data there. And just kind of, again, uh, being able to quickly eyeball the output from uh, this run, 
it looks like we've hit several rules, um, you know, multiple things uh, in the policy and hunting and information kind of category, some malware. Um, you know, and this is nice. This is pulled directly from the eve.json uh, file. And, you know, what we have here is the timestamp of when in the traffic this alert occurred. Um, this right here is the um, signature ID. So this number in the middle is a kind of unique uh, number associated with just this rule. Think of it like a hash. Um, you know, here we have the message. So kind of like what we're actually detecting. Um, so in this rule, we're saying, you know, ET policy, open SSL demo certificate uh, with internet widgets party. And then just kind of some supplemental kind of uh, data. So this is kind of flagged as not suspicious because a lot of people tend to use this open SSL demo um, certificate authority and various things. And then last but not least, we see our source IP port and destination IP and port. Um, and again, this is interesting, right? So we were just looking at an SSL cert, SSL cert on port 447, and now we're seeing one on port 449. And, you know, this is coming inbound to a client on our network. Um, and again, this is something that I would want to get more information on. Um, in this case, you know, this could be related to that SSL cert we looked at in Wireshark. Um, but this is where we can rely on Evebox to, um, you know, pivot into there to just get a little bit more information on some of these alerts. Um, so minimize that here. So we can pop up an Eve box using the shortcut on the desktop here. And, you know, sometimes this stuff does take a little bit to populate. So if you're in this virtual machine on your own um, and you're not, you know, seeing alerts, um, you know, firing or, or you're not seeing the data kind of populate in the various things, uh, just understand that sometimes after running the PCAP and restarting some of those services, um, there's a little bit of lag time that uh, occurs before you'll see, you know, alerts and data populate. Try and get this going. Again, apologies in the lag time here. Okay, so this is kind of the login here for uh, so the Evebox portion of Selks. Um, just make sure and get the HTTPS there in front, um, or else it'll complain about, uh, you know, it'll complain if the HTTPS isn't there. So we'll just get that going. Cool. So while that's uh, taking its sweet time, um, we'll go ahead and pop open uh, Wireshark one more time just to um, let me go back to the http.requests uh, filter just to kind of get a good look at the HTTP traffic one more time. All right. So while that's going there. So we'll log in with the uh, default Selks user, um, which is the same for uh, the virtual machine. Okay, so Evebox is neat. Uh, Evebox essentially just is a nice GUI kind of interface that overlays the eve.json file that Suricata creates. So similar to um, you know what Josh was showing a little bit early, some snippets of that. Um, you know, dealing with uh, JSON can sometimes be frustrating or annoying, especially for, you know, analysts who maybe like don't have a lot of experience working with that kind of data or aren't as comfortable working with that kind of data. So Evebox provides us a really nice uh, 
view of that eve.json file um, in, in a nice format. So uh, it does default to the last 24 hours of activity. And because this PCAP is from last month, um, we will have to change the time to all. And hopefully that will bring up our hits here. So yeah. So if this looks familiar, it should, uh, because this is basically the same uh, alerts we saw firing in the command line. Um, so I will switch over just to the alerts tab specifically. And I'm gonna modify the timestamp. So I'm gonna ensure it cascades kind of down from the earliest alert uh, to the you know, last alert that we saw in this PCAP. So starting here um, at 18.06 is kind of our first group of alerts. And when I say first group of alerts, that's because I see three uh, rules firing on the same timestamp and dealing with the same source and destination IPs. So clearly we have you know, our client here, 10.9.8.101, and uh, they're receiving an executable from this IP address, 185.172.12967. And you know, uh, first we see an informational signature hit just saying, hey, uh, an executable is coming inbound. It says it's an executable, just so you know. Um, we also have this policy, PEXE or DLL download. So again, we're seeing um, you know, a confirmed executable file coming inbound. Both of those on their own aren't really that interesting. But what's really interesting is our hunting signature. So from emerging threats, there's a hunting signature looking at a suspicious dotted quad host uh, MZ response. And what does that mean? Because it kind of feels like a, a pile of words that don't mean much. Um, using Evebox, we can actually click into this alert to get some more information. Um, so what this rule is basically looking for is uh, a get request going to an IP address host. So that's that dotted quad host. Um, so we're not looking at a resolved host name, you know, like you know, github.com or something. We're just seeing an IP address. And from that get request to the IP address is an executable in response. Um, so if we scroll down here in Evebox, we can see that request and understand it a little bit more. Um, so we have our host name here, which is again, is just that IP address. Um, we see it's a get request and it's retrieving property.php. Um, so that on its own is definitely suspicious. Um, you know, I'm not sure about you, but typically if I'm downloading an executable for whatever reason, uh, it's you know, very apparent in the URI um, that it is an executable. And just to confirm and make sure there's not a false positive or something happening, we can scroll down here to actually see the HTTP response body coming back from that server. And in this case, we do see the MZ header followed by you know, your common um, PE you know, artifacts indicating, yep, in fact, this is an executable. Um, you know, one thing that's cool that Suricata actually can do is um, file store. So you can configure Suricata to look uh, using file magic for various file types. And if they're found, so for example, we could look for executables on the wire. Um, anytime those are found, we could save those to disk and perform you know, further operation on that, whether it be hashing it, looking it up on virus total, or you know, putting it into your own like sandboxing pipeline to understand if the executables on your network are good or bad. Um, but yeah, so this alert on its own is definitely enough to kick off my incident responder brain of, okay, now what? So if we go back, um, back to our list of alerts, we can kind of move to the second group of alerts that I see here. So, um, you know, this executable is downloaded at 1806, and it's not until 1843 we see our next group of hits. And again, when I say group of hits, I'm saying because I see two signatures firing at the same time, going from the same IP to the same IP. And that is policy, external IP check to myexternalip.com, as well as a policy curl user agent outbound. Um, again, both of these uh, rules on their own, not necessarily evil. For example, if you're looking at a network that's, you know, developers, um, sysadmins, netops, you know, people who know how to use, you know, the computer and, and would have legitimate reasons to use these kinds of um, tools, uh, probably not bad. However, let's say you're, you know, looking at a VLAN that is your accounting department or, you know, your executive team and you see things like curl being used or, you know, an external IP check. Um, chances are, you know, people in those groups don't have a reason to be doing that or, you know, wouldn't really know what they're doing with that um, kind of information. So that really would kick, kick off in my brain. Uh, as a hunter, I need to know why this device was, you know, doing this kind of activity. Um, and again, using Evebox and clicking into this alert, we can scroll down and, you know, get some of that detailed information. And we see um, this was a get request to myexternalip.com 
We have curl in the user agent, meaning, you know, some process kicked this off. This wasn't a, you know, this probably wasn't a person typing in, uh, typing this into a browser and hitting it or, you know, again, coming up with kind of what would someone legitimately be doing. Um, and it's returning, you know, just the raw IP address. And, you know, this is something that we see often with malware. Um, it typically likes to, you know, try and find the external IP of a victim to put them in a geo uh, region and understand more who they've infected. So, you know, between seeing the executable being download and seeing this uh, alert, both coming from the same IP, I would be very worried, you know, as an incident responder. Um, so we'll come back to the list to try and understand what else might be happening. Um, so shortly after we see, you know, the executable being downloaded, we see an external IP address being uh, retrieved. Now we're seeing some more indication that something bad happened. First being the emerging threats uh, command and control uh, FIODO tracker reported CNC server. Um, so in this case, we're actually looking at just an IP. This is kind of an IP based rule. Um, and it's updated frequently based on various sources of intelligence. Um, and yeah, we're seeing an IP uh, talking on port 8082 from our same client here. Um, it doesn't look like there was a successful uh, sort of connection, but we see they tried and this IP address is located in Cambodia. Um, you know, I don't know about you, but you know, if my business didn't do any activity in that part of the world, um, one of my clients reaching out on a kind of a non-standard port would really you know, make my, the back of my hair kind of stand up and tingle um, and something that's worth looking into. And you know, kind of following up on that, we see a couple more. Uh, we see an attack response command completed. And we see, you know, in my mind, one of the more uh, sort of damning alerts that we could find in this traffic, which is a suspicious post containing common Windows process names, possible process list exfiltration. So we, you know, Again, on its own, maybe not the worst, um, you know, but again, in the context of this traffic, we can kind of understand if this is bad or not. You know, again, we're seeing our same infected client. We're seeing it's posting to an IP address on port 8082. This is the same port we just saw um, tagged as like a malicious IP address. And we can scroll down and see and learn more about this request. You know, again, our host name is a direct IP address. Uh, we kind of saw this in Wireshark, uh, for example. Um, you know, this kind of lines up here to the same post. Actually, it's this one here. So we can actually right click in Wireshark and follow stream to get an idea of, you know, what was happening in this post request. And we can click on HTTP stream there. And, you know, while this kind of builds, um, yeah, anytime data is posted somewhere, it's probably worth looking into, you know, um, not only is it posting this kind of process list information, but we see in here in the URI, that looks like a computer name, right? Um, definitely something, you know, we wouldn't want to see over the wire. Uh, furthermore, the user agent here doesn't seem legitimate. Uh, Win HTTP one slash O, they didn't even bother to, you know, uh, put a dot anywhere. And again, if we scroll down, we're seeing the list of uh, running processes on the machine. Um, we continue down even more. We're seeing command output from ipconfig slash all. And this is all reconnaissance that, you know, a malware uh, author would want to have returned to their command and control servers. So that way, when they go to look at their infected machines, um, they will know, kind of have an idea of who they've infected. Because um, while this just kind of is our, hey, it's a random desktop user, uh, it's poor Roger, um, you never know, you know, you might strike gold and, and have infected someone um, somewhere where you'd want to do more activity. Um, so with that, you know, we can confirm this computer has been popped, it's been infected, um, and we began the, the data exfiltration. Um, you know, as a hunter, I would probably dig in more into this alert and build even more alerts, um, probably specifying some of these processes. And it would be a good chance for you to look into your own network and say, hey, um, you know, where uh, what specific things maybe do our computers have? You know, what running processes or system information is unique to our machines? Do, do we name uh, our machines a certain way? Um, and you could build certain hunting rules looking for that going across the wire. So anytime someone was transferring that kind of information, uh, you'd be able to kind of have that hunting alert to pivot off of and understand if it's, you know, a legitimate use by someone or if it's actually um, nefarious activity. Um, so with that post, we'll kind of come back here. And now we're seeing some alerts looking at HTTP traffic on port 443. 
And in this case, it's a post request. And on that same uh, kind of timestamp, we're also seeing a generic suspicious post to a dotted quad with a fake browser. <laughs> and again, that kind of, um, you know, uh, tongue twister uh, of an alert is basically just saying, hey, um, you know, we're seeing an IP address uh, or a, a post request directly to an IP address using a fake browser. And, you know, again, we can click in with Evebox and kind of understand what is a fake browser, right? And if we scroll up, we can see that here. Um, this is Mozilla, you know, 4.0. 4 um, if I'm not mistaken, you know, that's from like 2011 and, you know, shouldn't be in use. Um, all of this is kind of outdated. And the way that this uh, user agent was created is kind of non-standard. So someone certainly didn't, you know, type something into their browser uh, to generate this request. Um, furthermore, you know, I'm seeing the same kind of URI pattern that we've seen across some of those other requests. And scrolling down, we can see the payload, open SSH private keys not something you want to see uh, leaving your network, right? Um, and these are all bad. And again, I mean, we're finding this all off of basic generic hunting kind of rules. Um, you know, uh, I believe the ET Pro uh, rule set, which is a paid rule set, has specific rules that detects all of this malware activity. Um, but in this case, we do have an abuse.ch SSL uh, block list rule. So if you guys remember when we looked at the uh, Wireshark output of that one suspicious looking SSL cert, here we can actually see it pretty quick uh, within Evebox. So we see it's coming from an IP address based in Russia uh, on port 447, again, kind of non-standard for TLS uh, SSL. And scrolling down, we get a lot of nice information here. So we have things like the fingerprint, the JAW3 hash. Um, JAW3 is a really cool uh, kind of tool that can be effective for these kinds of things. And if we were to click on any of these fields, we would then be able to query um, our, our uh, JSON data for anything that lines up with that. And here we see the meat of this, which is again, that uh, kind of fake um, generic looking SSL cert, right? We have uh, just things that don't make sense here. Example.com, um, you know, things that are illegitimate and we've confirmed that, hey, this is definitely uh, a true positive in the sense that we're looking at Drydex or TrickBot malware. And, you know, just based on open source reporting, um, you know, in malware analysis, you'd be able to determine that between this SSL cert and uh, these post requests, uh, we would be looking at TrickBot malware. Not to mention, you know, the PCAP kind of gave it away, but um, let's pretend we didn't know that. So we've confirmed at this point that our, um, our malicious document uh, reached out, downloaded an executable file onto our network. That executable file then began doing things like checking an external IP address of the client it ran on, and ultimately communicated with a command and control server, uh, posting system information and otherwise, um, you know, kind of data that we didn't want leaving our network, like open SSH keys, for example. And we've confirmed that by, you know, seeing our, our malware hit on that traffic. But then kind of coming down and, and seeing uh, further down our timeline here, we're now seeing some subsequent uh, downloads. So could this be potentially a stage two download? Is this, um, you know, is TrickBot potentially downloading ransomware uh, or some other kind of stealer or something, worm, uh, spam bot? We don't know, but we can see, you know, we have another executable being downloaded. And this time we're seeing a uh, new user agent that's different from the initial download. And so if we click in, we can kind of see that here. Um, you know, we're seeing the get request to an IP, of course. Uh, using this win HTTP loader uh, user agent. The request in and of itself is going for shortwave.png. Uh, but if we actually scroll down, we're seeing we're not getting a, a PNG file back. We're actually getting an executable again. Um, and again, having something like file store, uh, being able to understand, you know, even within Wireshark, um, you know, being able to come in here and, uh, you know, export uh, our objects we can actually save that to disk to um, you know, perform further analysis. Again, looking up a hash on virus total, submitting it to a sandbox, um, or you know, hey, if you're really great, uh, reverse engineering it yourself. But uh, here we see some of the objects, um, you know, and here we'd be able to actually download uh, that executable just right out of Wireshark, which is really cool. I use that a ton uh, when I'm going through artifacts and PCAPs. Uh, whether it's, you know, HTML, uh, VB script, executables, or what. 
Um, so with that, you know, within Suricata, um, you know, for example, uh, if I wanted to create some more hunting rules, um, you know, I could come into that post request that was using that win HTTP uh, user agent that was very strange. And I could actually write a rule myself on that traffic. So I'll, I would know, you know, hey, this is TrickBot, a TrickBot user agent, this win HTTP one slash O. So if I were to create that rule, I would just come into my um, command line here and edit the sigdev.rules file. So I'm just gonna kind of go below some of those other rules and I'm just gonna start, I'm gonna say alert. So this is kind of the default Suricata behavior. It'll just basically present an alert to the analyst, but not do anything with the traffic. It won't block the traffic. It won't drop the traffic. It'll just simply uh, tell us it saw it and keep the traffic moving. Um, we can declare a protocol, which is HTTP in this case. And one cool thing with Suricata is it being protocol aware, we don't actually have to declare uh, any ports that we would see HTTP traffic on. So in this case, um, you know, we were seeing uh, you know, we were seeing this HTTP traffic on port uh, like 447, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, we don't have to rely on pre-configuring that port. Um, just telling Suricata, look for HTTP traffic, it'll know regardless of what port it's on. And that's a really powerful um, aspect. And so in this case, we want to detect this user agent. So we're going to say home net on any port going to the external net on any port. Um, essentially, like in a default configuration, your home net is kind of your RFC 1918 private IP addresses, and your external net is essentially you know, not that. So usually you know, the internet. Um, so for our message, we can just say ET hunting, um, or we could just say malware actually. And we can just say uh, trick bot user agent. Win HTTP. And we can give our rule of flow and we will say established. And what that means is we're essentially saying ensure that there is a three way handshake occurring. Um, uh, because it's HTTP, it's TCP based, uh, we want to make sure that this was a completed um, sort of traffic flow. So we'll say established and we will uh, say comma to server. And with that, we're essentially saying, hey, make sure that my home net client initiates this request and we're going out to that external net. And then I can just say something like HTTP.header. So within the HTTP header, I want to find when HTTP and you know, I'll just give it the number one. I won't finish that. Um, actually, I'll tighten it up by saying user agent. I'll include some hex here. And the way that we do that is we give it a pipe. We say 3a20, so that's the hex for um, colon and space. And I'll say win HTTP. I'll delete the one actually. And as simple as that, um, that's basically a rule. And I'll say class type uh, Trojan activity. And I'll give it a unique uh, signature ID. And I'll just say 1,000 or 1 million one um, and a revision number. That's just kind of some net metadata that's not terribly important. But with that, we've just uh, kind of on the fly uh, generated this uh, Suricata rule that now we can immediately implement into our network for hunting. Um, and if I wanted to kind of do that and reload uh, those rules, you can say suri.sh, give it that pcap, oops, root, and kick off that process. And now we'll be reinspecting that PCAP, um, but with our newest kind of rule that we, you know, kind of through this quick, um, you know, triage of the PCAP, uh, we now know that that's something that we should be looking for and something that we'd hone in on. But again, ultimately, um, you know, when it comes to network hunting, we're just basically relying on these signatures as a highlighter to, to find this kind of traffic that you know, normally we wouldn't uh, maybe notice, you know, things like posts on non-standard ports, um, 
you know, posts with strange user agents, uh, and even just simple things like executables being downloaded, right? Um, and it ultimately, when it comes to hunting, it comes down to context and understanding your network. Are these things normal? Are these normal occurrences in your, you know, monitored uh, networks? Or is this an anomaly? And, you know, that's the kind of thing where, you know, people sometimes see these alerts and say, well, it's a false positive because like, I don't need to see this. You know, I don't care if curl is being used in my environment. I have tons of developers and they use curl all the time. And then, you know, I kind of would respond to that and say like, I don't think it's a false positive because the rules, you know, um, detecting what it's looking for, you know, I think it's just a matter of mindset in terms of, you know, should, should you be seeing it, you know? Um, and if it's not necessary, you know, we can use various rule management tools like Sirius or Suricata update to, um, you know, disable or remove those kinds of rules from, uh, you know, our normal flow. So we wouldn't see those anymore. But again, it's all comes down to context and, you know, what's normal, because if you don't know what's normal, um, this stuff might not mean anything, right? You won't actually be able to hunt uh, without having that baseline. So we'll see here if uh, our Suricata process ran um, any faster than it did before. And if not, I'm terribly sorry, but uh, it might be a good segue into kind of just wrapping up with any final questions, but uh, we'll see here. Yeah, again, this VM's a, a little bit memory uh, heavy. So again, use at your own kind of discretion if you uh, do pop that into uh, your own network. But yeah, Josh, uh, did you have anything to add kind of uh, going through that process or anything you would do different or? No, no, I, it's just, uh, I, I think that's, you know, a great foundation, as Jack had mentioned, um, a lot of times then, once you've collected the data, you can, you can pivot to those external threat intelligence sources, abuse CH and, and the virus totals. Um, you can get file information um, in the, uh, the file info events. So if you look in Evebox or in the, in the original JSON, um, you, you, since those PE files were not obfuscated or encrypted, then there will likely be file of identification. There might be a hash, although the default configuration of Suricata is only to read so far into the HTTP response stream. So you'll notice a state when a file is read, if it's, if it's truncated, it means it didn't read all the bytes. So your hashes are no good. You gotta go in and tweak that configuration. Otherwise you'll have a hash as part of the output for that file. And so you can grab that immediately and, and use that to, uh, to further pivot. Um, I was just checking, uh, I guess I'm not 100% sure if we are wrapping up at a quarter two or if we have until the top of the hour. Um, I thought we just had the hour, but I wanted to just double check because if we have a little more time, um, we could probably jump into a quick demo. Uh, I certainly have something ready to go if we wanted to do that. But if we're out of time, <laughs> then we need to wrap it up and just answer questions. So if anyone knows the answer, Ross or anyone yeah, else. Yeah, you have till two o'clock, Josh. So two, okay, so we have oh, okay. another 15 minutes or so. Go full, awesome. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, Jack, did you have anything? Did you want to continue with? No, no, I wasn't sure. Uh, I actually wasn't sure either when, when there you know, if we had a hard cutoff or not, but, uh, no, I think, um, yeah, if you have something lined up, I think that'd be a great, just to, there, there is a hard cutoff at 2 PM at 2 PM. Okay. Um, well, yeah, I do have a PCAP I could get into. I'm sure I could keep it to about 10 minutes. Uh, so just to give us a few minutes of buffer. Um, okay. so if you want to, if we want to hang tight, Oh, it looks like a little <laughs> bit of bad feedback here. <laughs> yep. Cigarette, you know, doesn't have yeah. the rules. Awesome. Yeah. Um, uh, right. And we can bounce back to that too, if you want, uh, Jack, if you square away your syntax. Otherwise, I'm, I imagine everyone can figure out what the, the conclusion to that is that you'll see that. <laughs> you'll see yeah. that alert. Yeah. No, I mean, um, Let no, me know. it's a, a basic thing there. But no, no, please, uh, you know, go ahead, Josh, take over and, and uh, show off what you got. Okay. Um, give me just one second here to reorient my screen. Um, now, keep in mind, I, I wasn't 100% ready to go on this. Uh, I was just thinking as we were talking here, what if we have extra time? Um, I should do this one. And, and Jack and I actually talked about this as another uh, a scenario that I, I think will be interesting. Um, the PCAP is not in the drive. I, I will get that uploaded. I'll probably throw a readme in there and I'll put a password on it just because uh, oftentimes when you're downloading PCAPs that contain malware, you just run into issues, although this one may not be a problem. 
Um, as Jack showed, you can run the uh, Surrey.sh script. Um, I did that already just to expedite things. So under exercises, uh, the sudo Surrey.sh and then the location. Now, this one, um, much like the, the, the trick bot, uh, I put the name in the PCAP so I wouldn't forget. It's a Netwire PCAP. And uh, running that, uh, we just get this single result here. We just get the single alert. So we can see that there was a, a, you know, a, a, a query to a DuckDNS domain. Um, and, and Jack, if you have anything you want to jump in here, please feel free to do that. So, so not a lot of information, and that's where you might want to then take this. Uh, for example, if we select the alert like you saw, um, we have the flow ID. And what the flow ID can do, or what, what I use it for at times, is to try to step back a little bit from that particular alert and look at other events that happened around that. Um, here we can see that this is just events around that DNS query, uh, which makes sense because that's what the alert is indicating. And the query is for crimea-kremlin.duckdns.org. That was a tongue twister, um, which of course is, is quite suspicious. Uh, I don't think I've ever been to a website that has those words in it, uh, at least for legitimate purposes. But right now we're not seeing anything that is particularly significant other than, boy, I'm awfully suspicious right now. Um, in EveBox, we have the different event types. So this is where those protocol logs can come in to be very handy and that this helps us again to build some context. So knowing that malware authors are regularly using HTTP to download payloads, to do command and control, as you saw, to do data exfil, um, it's a good filter or a good um, view to look at all the HTTP events. Now, all of this recent stuff was from me. We want to ignore that. We want to just look at this PCAP, which is from four months ago. So you can see the data down below here. And what we get, I didn't mean to click that. What we get are get requests to office-service-tech.info, pld.txt, and office-service-tech.info, um, rnp.txt, um, as well as this get requests to a, another fairly suspicious domain for code.txt. So we might want to see what those are, what that, what the content was returned there. Now, every once in a while, I find the deep box just doesn't show me the data that I want. Um, and so maybe then I go and, and pivot to something like using Wireshark or using Moloch. Um, you do have in this setup here, you do have uh, Moloch already installed and set up and that Surrey .sh script goes ahead and feeds the PCAP to Moloch as well as Suricata. So this is just another way of looking at this data. But for right now, I want to go ahead and use Wireshark. So filtering on HTTP, just like we did, uh, not seeing, of course, any of the events from my recent recent VM traffic, we can see all of these different HTTP requests. So let's focus on um, rnp.txt. Uh, we'll go ahead and do a right-click follow TCP stream. And we can see that this definitely looks suspicious um, because this looks a lot like, like PowerShell. And I, I say that just by seeing these initial few characters right here. Um, if we scroll down, um, which this is a lot of content and sometimes with our tools, of course, just because of the size of the content, it can really put a strain on them. And uh, we're gonna experience that here a little bit is that it's gonna be a bit strained. So instead of trying to look at all that content, it might be easiest just to export those objects as, as Jack had done earlier. So we can go to file export HTTP and then these are all of the different files, those HTTP response payloads that we can extract out. Um, from there, we can use a text editor. And so now we can see here is that original content. And if we scroll down to the bottom, uh, further evidence that we are dealing with some sort of PowerShell script. And the, really the, the, the primary giveaway is this IEX, which is invoke expression. It's a, a shortcut for executing a PowerShell script. So much like you have eval statements in languages like JavaScript and PHP, this is, this is one of those statements. So all of this appears to be getting converted to ASCII and then executed. So if we want to investigate this, we'd want to convert this to ASCII. And this can actually be quite straightforward um, and that we can take all of this content here. Well, not really all of it, but we can take the characters. So I'm just going to select the uh, right before the closing parenthesis, right after that last character, that last numerical value and go back to the top, grab the first one. All right, we can copy this and now we can use something like CyberChef in order to do this conversion for us. Uh, probably the 
easiest way to get into CyberChef uh, from the, the inside the VM here. Um, there's the there's the hosted one online. Um, you can also, if you open up Moloch, you can just go ahead, pick any one of these sessions, and ask it to open up Source or Dest with CyberChef, and that'll just launch us into CyberChef. So either one of those is fine. Um, if you actually wanted to manipulate or work with the actual content there, then you would want to pick the right session. And, and that might be another option that we do here is, is find that response and send that response payload to CyberChef. But um, I've already got it in the clipboard, so I'm just going to go ahead, reset these tabs, and paste it in. Um, as you saw earlier, we were having some trouble. We were having some trouble viewing all that content because it's, it's quite large. And so what will happen here with uh, CyberChef is that it'll tell us that, hey, it's just a, a large payload. And so it doesn't really give us the, uh, the opportunity to see that. But we know that we want to convert that, that, that content to an ASCII string. And what CyberChef allows us to do then is to take from all of these different recipes over here, these different formulas, I guess you would call them, and, and build a recipe. So typically when you have content like that, a, a, an array of numerical values that can convert it to a string, um, then you, it's a from char code. So we can grab that. Oh, I already had it there. Um, we can, so in this case, I can uncomment that. And you'll have to note a couple of different options here. Um, first, the delimiter. We had a, uh, a comma separated list of values. So we need to make sure that we select that value. Um, the default is also base 16. And those values were, were certainly not base 16, they were base 10. You can go back to the original payload and you can see 115, yeah, this looks like a base 10 value. So we just need to make sure that both of those are set correctly. And now you can see that we have that deobfuscated, um, that, that converted payload, that te text. So that was being done, of course, all automatically by the PowerShell. It was, it was converting itself to ASCII and then executing itself. And what this is now doing, um, it's defining this byte array and I think that's it. Yeah, defining that byte array and then essentially loading that into memory and executing it. And much like you saw with some of the traffic that uh, the Jack was looking at, um, what we want to recognize here is um, our PE file and the, the MZ header. So maybe you recognize that. Maybe you're already familiar with that. Um, MZ is typically the first two bytes of our PE file. Uh, typically, it is the first two bytes of our PE file, um, amongst other things. And when we look at M and Z in hex, the numeric value of that is 45A. So we can see that, yes, we are we're certainly dealing with a PE file. So if we just continue to use CyberChef to extract that content, we could, I'm just going to copy it. Yeah, you do have the option to replace input with output, um, but I'll just copy and paste it because I would still need to remove the unnecessary PowerShell. I just want to get the actual content here. Um, now from this one, we have uh, these asterisk characters. Those are not going to convert nicely if we try to convert this from hex value to the binary content that it needs to be to get that actual PE file. So now what we can do is we can find a replace. So we'll find an asterisk. We don't want a regular expression. We'll just do a simple string. We don't want to replace it with anything. Okay, so that will now manipulate this input and give us that output. Um, and then we want to convert to hex. And our delimiter here is also the comma. Oh, that doesn't look right. What did I miss, Jack? Don't ask me, I couldn't even write a rule to detect a user agent. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You have about oh, seven uh, minutes left, you guys. Gosh, two hex, from hex. Now let's try that. Seven minutes, yep, all right, awesome. So we don't wanna take that data and convert it to hex, it was already in hex, we wanna convert it from hex. So we're gonna take that hex value, convert it back to its binary. Now we have the MZ. So we can see here in this output, this looks exactly like what you saw earlier in the traffic that Jack was analyzing. Here's our PE file. And now we can save this output to file. Download.dat is the common name. Uh, we can go ahead and save that. We can then go back to our terminal. 
let's go back a directory. We can do an MD5 of that file. Okay, MD5 sum. Always miss that. Um, and now we have a hash and we can start looking around to see where else this exists. So places that I typically go, uh, the URL house, uh, even though the URL house is, is primarily URLs, they also have all of the payloads. And so if you paste in a payload here and the URL house knows about it, it'll tell you what domain it came from, what the URL was that dropped it. If it's not there, we can look at the, um, um, the malware bazaar, another abuse.ch project. You can see here is the hash, the DLL, it's a DLL type. Um, but in this case, one of the main things I'm looking for oftentimes is just what, what family of malware am I dealing with if I didn't know that already. So looking at a signature, looking at a tag, um, there's nothing here. VirusTotal can also oftentimes provide some insight. And, and there's a number of other platforms, Alien Vault, OTX, and others that we could go and look to see if we can identify this. Now, in this case, um, this isn't the primary payload that was dropped. Uh, it's NetWire. NetWire is the second payload. And if we go back to our original traffic, you'll notice that there was several requests. There was code.txt, rmp.txt, and then pld.txt. And if we look at this content here, I just wanna get the first few bytes pulled up. Hopefully that'll happen. Um, maybe not though. Maybe the easier thing to do is to save it to, to do an extraction there. Maybe not. Well, anyways, you'll see that it follows a very similar pattern and that you're going to find, there we go, export object, HTTP, pld.txt. We'll save that to our desktop. And let's open that with Visual Studio. Right, and there we go. Um, this one's even a little more straightforward in that you, you immediately recognize um, the evidence of a PE file. And visually as a human, we can see that this is pretty simple, pretty, tr it's, you know, it's trivial what they did in order to, um, to pad this. They added a couple of arbitrary characters. And if you looked at, there was, a, a, I came across several NetWire examples around this time. They would, they would deviate the padding here, the dollar sign characters in this case. And then a lot of threat actors do the same thing. They just change the characters or, you know, very trivial things about it. Um, just to stay ahead of, of us defenders. Um, so programmatically, um, I don't know, we didn't see any, at least in ET open and in the other rule sets we have configured, we didn't see any alerts. So it was effective in avoiding that alert saying that a PE file was downloaded. It is a PE file and it just used the PowerShell in order to very easily remove that additional unnecessary characters, uh, convert it to its, its binary content and execute it. And if this one, you went through a very similar process of extracting, however you did it with CyberChef or, or similar, um, this would be your, your primary NetWire Trojan. Um, Gosh, okay. About three minutes left. Yeah, I think that's all I wanted to cover. Um, Jack, do you have any thoughts or insights or anything maybe you would do next or you would have done differently? Yeah, no, I mean, um, you know, I think that's a cool use case for, you know, kind of just pivoting off of different things and, you know, coming up with an answer to the question of what, you know, what is getting downloaded. Um, but no, I mean, I think I would probably just look at that, um, get request again, you know, get, look at what was coming uh, across the wire before any of the, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, manipulation of the file to actually see what it was and, you know, see if there were any ways we could come up with rules to, to kind of detect that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, just looking at different things, uh, there that stick out, you know, there's some of the PowerShell usage, you know, com spec, uh, join string, um, you know, and just trying yeah, to yeah, find ways like, that we could highlight yeah. that and maybe help us get a head start in terms of, uh, that triage. Um, you know, just any way that it can help light up our, um, alert dashboard with, with stuff that, you know, helps tell the story. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. I think now we are pretty much out of time. Um, I'm not, I don't have the QA open. Let me get back to that. looks like there aren't any questions. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Okay. Awesome. Well, uh, we'll hang out until they shut us down. 
but uh, that's only in a, in a minute or so. Thank you everyone for uh, spending the last hour and 15 minutes with us. We really appreciate the time and the opportunity. Thank you everyone at Wireshark and SharkFest. Uh, we were you know, disappointed when we heard it was canceled and then really excited when we heard that we'd have a virtual option this year. So it's, it's great to still get together and be a part of the community. Uh, if there's anything that we can do, please don't hesitate to reach out to either one of us. Yeah, Josh, uh, pick the words out of my mouth. Thanks so much for SharkFest. Uh, great organization. I use Shark, Wire Shark like <laughs> six hours of the day every day. Um, so I couldn't be more than ha uh, happier to be here. So um, yeah, definitely reach out on Twitter, email uh, with any questions. You know, there's only so much we can get done in an hour. So um, wish we had, you know, eight. <laughs>